Hey guys, this is Nate with the Tackle Time Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. We are officially in the double digits now. This is number 11. I can't believe it's already number 11. Uh, just wild to think uh, 11 episodes in. And, uh, you know, I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. I'm glad it did. I know I'm learning a lot. I hope that you guys are too. Um, if you are enjoying this podcast, somebody shared it with you or you're unfamiliar, please subscribe. If you're watching us on YouTube, please uh, subscribe there. Um, if you're on a podcast, make sure you become a subscriber there. Drop us a like, all that good stuff. I would definitely appreciate it. Uh, this week, we have Alan Reed on. Um, a little different than we have. Alan is a... He's a tournament angler, so you're going to hear things pretty much from the eyes of a, a tournament angler, and that's mostly what he does. And he travels a lot, he fishes a lot from all over the country, and he really enjoys it. And this is a lot of what he does, you know, even in, during the week. You know, he's fishing multiple times a week, and uh, I think it, it seems you know, he's been fishing for the last few years pretty seriously and, and started to hone the craft really well. So you know, the things he's going to talk about come from that perspective. So uh, he's pretty entrenched in the fishing world. And if you aren't familiar, make sure you connect with him, follow him on Facebook, uh, YouTube, all that good stuff. Um, before we jump into that episode, I've told you, I told you before, I'm gonna tell you again, you need new gear. Of course you need new gear. Everybody needs new gear who was fishing for, well, fish, obviously. If that's why you're tuned in, you're fishing for fish. So when you're fishing for fish, you're going to need new gear. You lose gear, you break gear, you lose all kinds of stuff. I know how much gear I've lost and I don't even have that much. So next time you need gear, you have to check out TackleBuys.com. TackleBuys lists thousands and thousands of sale listings from across the web for places that have the same gear that you already love on sale. So instead of paying full price at your local retailer or even on the big box stores online, Check out TackleBuys.com before you go and buy new gear. If you need new hooks like we're going to talk about in this episode, go on TackleBuys.com and see if somebody has them on sale. If you're going to buy a new rod and buy a new rod and reel combo, I mean, they're expensive. You're talking about anything up from 100 bucks to three or $400. Next time you're going to buy one, check and see if somebody has what you want on sale or a very comparable one. A lot of times that happens. So make sure you check out TackleBuys before you go and buy new gear. Again, it's TackleBuys.com. Check out the deals page and you can sort by all the categories and, and deals and all that. So anyway, that being said, we're going to get into this episode. All right. What's up, guys? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Tackle Time podcast. Tonight, I have Alan Reed. Alan, thanks again for coming on with us tonight. Definitely appreciate you being here. No problem. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how how did you get started fishing it seems like everybody has the the same kind of story they got started really young and you know they were catching bluegill you know how, how did it start for you uh well i am not that story <laughs> uh so for me it started that we would go cat fishing and uh, you know that's fun you know you sit on the bank for a little while mm -hmm. hang out with friends but uh I'm a pretty, you know, kind of like to stay moving, stay doing things. So uh, I said, you know what? Uh, I want to get a rod and a reel for Christmas, and I'm going to teach myself to bass fish. And so that was in the winter of 2015. I got my first rod and reel for Christmas. It was a bait caster. That's what I wanted. Taught myself to throw a bait caster over that winter. And then, uh, as I thought about it, I thought, you know, I have this cheap little hardware store kayak. I can get out on these little ponds where the boats are going. Yeah. So as soon as the weather got warm enough, I was out there and uh, went to a little lake near my house. And the first fish I caught was three and a half pound bass. So not a bad way to start. Oh, definitely. And then, uh, you know, just started doing it some more. And then three months into the... Uh, little fishing thing that I'd started there. I saw a post for the Indiana Open. It was a kayak tournament. You could fish any public water in the state of Indiana. You just had to be back to uh, moving water outfitters is what it is now um, by three o'clock in the afternoon for your check-in. So signed up for that. And uh, out of 71 anglers, I was, I believe, ninth. Wow. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm not too bad at this thing. That's and awesome. Just, wore that kayak out in a year and uh you know from all the fishing i was doing and just just kept going from there 
So do you, all these years later, do you still fish from a kayak or have you kind of upgraded since or, or changed? I shouldn't say upgraded because I don't know if fishing from a boat or a kayak is an upgrade, but. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I fished from a kayak. So that next year I actually bought a real fishing kayak. And then uh, now I fish from a Bonafide SS 127 um, with a motor guide XI3 trolling motor on it with a hummingbird uh nine inch mega uh you know power pole you know i'm going out six or seven rods you know so it's uh you know i get a lot of a lot of people uh asking questions and stuff about it you know i run two gopros on that as well to try to catch what i'm doing out there on the water so um i i've actually only ever fished on a bass boat three times oh, okay. in my life so I I'll tell you what, I, um, I was lucky enough. My buddy has an SS 127 and if, if they offered it in a pedal drive, I, I'd already own it. I wish they did. Um, it's a fantastic yeah. boat, you know, but it, it's just, you know, even without it's easy to paddle. It was my experience in it, even though it was short was, was, was incredible. I love that boat. I, like I said, a couple of things I would change, but you know, they're just an incredible boat. If anybody's looking for a great kayak. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a great stable platform. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the only thing that anybody ever says, man, I wish Bonafide would offer a pedal drive. I, but, I think it's uh, the only complaint. I think it can be the only complaint. It is. It's a <laughs> super comfortable seat too. Definitely. Definitely. So, so where does that put you in, in the world of fishing now, Alan? I mean, obviously you've been fishing for a number of years. I mean, what are you all about? I mean, I know a little bit about you, but I, I want to know a whole lot more. I mean, I know you have a YouTube channel. I know you're, you're, you're active on Facebook. You do other things, you know, tell us about you. Yep. Um, so I kind of jumped head first into this whole fishing thing. Uh, it's kind of what I've done with everything I've ever done. So uh, I went out that, that first year and started tournament fishing, um, after, you know, when I got a real kayak, um, fish my local clubs, which is a great place for people to get started that are wanting to get into kayak fishing, a lot of good clubs around the country. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I want angler of the year, um, for, uh, SIAC that first year out there. Great. Uh, qualified for, uh, it was the KBS classic. They no longer exist, but, uh, that was my first trip to a big lake. That was Gunnersville. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah. And I remember I got big bass day one. Um, it, it was such a great event. I made the cut to the third day. And, uh, so that kind of was like, man, I, a lot of people get scared of the big lakes and I wasn't scared of them. It was just a new experience, but it was yeah. all a new experience to me. So, um, you know, I wouldn't really shine away from it. Um, it was fishing, I fished the KBF national championship that next year. Um, that was when we were on Kentucky Lake with 751 anglers, and I finished uh, 65th. Wow! Wow! Uh, again, not not a bad start. Well, some of the best, I'm I'm sure. So that, that's oh yeah, a good competition. Yeah, and just kind of worked my way up into uh, fishing more regional type events or the trail events that were around, and then um, with the three national series out there now, it's it's kind of hard for me to find my way into a lot of the local tournaments but I do support them. So I'm one of the admins for the Southern Indiana Yak Angler Club. So, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of the, you know, they set the tournament schedule, uh, taking care of anglers questions, all that kind of stuff. Right. And then I've kind of become the kind of rules interpreter in a way for a lot of those things. Oh, wow. If there's kind of a, you know, a question about whether or not there should be a deduction or, or things like that. Um, we're not judging our fish, but, uh, you know, those things do come up and Definitely. I'll play a part in that. And then, um, we also have Hoosier kayak bassin. So that was a, a joint thing, uh, between Sam Jones and I, uh, one of the things that we saw was missing was the local anglers in our state really weren't getting the recognition that we wanted them to get. And so that was a way for us to promote the anglers the series that we have in Indiana. So we have four different series there and uh, really tapping into what they're doing, sharing information around that, but also being an information source. So we started the podcast with that as well. Um, here's your kayak bassin. We've had different anglers on to talk about their experiences, tournament directors on 
uh, we had a sports psychologist on to talk about the mental side of fishing, which oh, wow. everybody talks about it, but but had never really dove into it before. So that was a really good discussion. And uh, we then we do uh, something I'm we're really proud of. We call it the Turkey Bowl, and that is a charitable uh, tournament we hold typically around Thanksgiving. This year, with all the COVID stuff, um, we had to kind of postpone that for now uh, mm. because we also do a food drive. Oh and wow! While, wow. Well, the tournament fishing is is fun, and we give out prizes, sponsor prizes, and stuff like that. Um, we filled up the entire bed of my truck last year with donations that the anglers brought to give to wow. Wow. people in the community. That's awesome. That's 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 incredible, man. Good for you. That that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as far as my fishing, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm mainly on the, the national tournament scenes. I mean, I drive all over the place, uh, fishing wherever there's tournaments. So, and even right now, kind of tournament season is kind of wrapped up. I mean, I've got two more this year, but, you know, I'm on the road. I'm down in Alabama right now uh, fishing some waters that are typically on our tournament trails, just learning about them because I've never been here before. Oh, so, okay. Um, any any time on the water is good time on the water, right? I mean, it's it's always a learning opportunity. No, for sure. Wow, that's you really are. You're in deep at this point. You're you're all. I, I am. Is, is I am. This, it I sounds am. like this might be all you do. I mean, do you have a day job or is this kind of like I, you're all the way? No, I I do have a day job. Dang. Um, I manage a I manage an engineering team for Cummins. Wow. Wow. Um, I've been with them for 21 years and uh, I've been fortunate enough, you know, last year is when I really started doing the, the national travel and mm-hmm. had an agreement with my uh, boss at the time that, you know, I was working on the road and doing the tournaments and everything got covered. Right. I mean, that, and wow. that's what mattered um, this year. Um, hmm. You know, COVID changed a lot of things and we were working from home anyway. Yeah. And so yeah. it just made that all that much easier to just, to work that way. And, and, and that's not unique to me. Um, for probably the first 14 years of my career, I traveled and, oh, okay. uh, none of my, I've never had a team that reported to me that's ever been in the same location anyway. So I got it. Uh, while this is kind of abnormal for a lot of people, this is a very normal environment for me. Wow. No, that that's, that's awesome that you're in the position you are to, to have so much coverage and to do so many things. And hit so many places. So no, I, I commend you for that. I'm sure it's a lot to manage, but it sounds like you're having a great time. So um, I am, I mean, there is a lot to it, you know, and you, you start trying to do some of these things. I said last year that I, I didn't really want to get into doing the, the GoPro editing and YouTube thing. Cause it's just you know, it's so much time and, and all that. And I, I, but I had a kind of a vision of what I would want that to look like if I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it was, it would have been about May this year. It's one of the very first tournaments after COVID started. Um, I'd had some problems with a GoPro um, 8. And uh, I went to exchange it. They didn't have one. So they upgraded me to a uh, Max 360, which is the 360 camera. Yeah. So yeah. I, run, I run that you know, out in front of me. And then I run a Hero 7 over my shoulder. Oh, nice. And I was just out on the water. And I just looked at that camera. And I just started talking to it. And uh, I guess that's part of the beauty of having a, a 360 camera because it's kind of like having a cameraman in the boat is what I refer to it as. That's awesome. And so that's, you know, uh, kind of got to, you know, I'm still working on it, right? I mean, and, and it's one of those, like, you see all these other people do these videos and you go out and you expect it, that your stuff's going to look like that. And then you try to do it and it's like, oh, you know, if I, I wish I would have done that when I was that's on the tough. water. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely been a growing um you know, this, I, I'm still going to do it. I mean, I have what, 10 terabytes of, of video from my journeys this wow. year to edit. Wow. Um, so I'll be putting the content out, but I, I'm learning a ton about what I want to do different for next year and, and mm-hmm. kind of make it what I really envisioned when I, you know, first started talking about doing a GoPro channel. No, that's, that's wild. I mean, I know just as you said, it's, you realize as soon as you get out there and you come back and as you said, you, you think your video is going to be you know, the masterpiece that you see on there. And there's a lot of work that goes into it, you know, oh, all, the, all the music, all the editing, all, all putting it all together, you know, so uh, I, I can relate to that for sure. There's a lot yeah. to it. Definitely. So yep. where does that put your YouTube channel at now? Um, so I'm going to try to do two videos a week. 
Um, I have this, uh, the series that I've launched called the journeyman, mm-hmm. um, which is, well, it kind of started one way. And then, uh, when I just made the decision, I was just going to travel around and fish and kind of turned into that kind of journeyman. But, um, I, I'm still really, really new to this fishing thing. Right. I mean, there's, like you said, there's people who have been doing this since they were in diapers. And, uh, so I'm, I feel like I'm on the crash course sure. and, uh, being out there, like I said, being on the water and, and tr- as much as I can, and then trying to capture all that stuff. Cause I, there's so much stuff that happens to us, especially when we're on the road that there's so many people intrigued by that. And, yeah. uh, yeah. and then, and then my growth from going from, you know, not fishing at all to now here I am four years later, uh, pretty good success. Um, and, and been able to document that and kind of, but, but I know I still have a ways to go. Right. I, my, yeah. my goal, right. I want to be the best. Um, you know, that's how I go into everything that I do. And, uh, and I'm not the best, um, but I want to be there. Maybe I'll never be the best, but, I, but I'm going to sure give my best effort to get there. So that's the other journey of journeyman is how do I continue to grow through this fishing? Um, and then while also capturing the, the journey of going around place to place. No, and you know what? I'm glad you brought that up because I watched, I don't know if it was your first or second video. I'm, I'm thinking it was your first judging by what you said about the journeyman series. And I wanted to make sure we cover that. Cause as you said, I think a lot of people see, they see people out in kayaks. They see people out on bass boats. They see the tournament scene as, you know, from, the boat side, but there's a lot of work that goes into it. Otherwise, you know, there's a lot of other things that contribute for sure. So I think it's important to bring that full circle. And I don't think anybody else is doing that. Yeah, that was, that was what I had envisioned when I kind of put this thing together. There was actually a, as a YouTube series that was put together. Um, they were following some FLW anglers hmm. and, uh, and they did that for a few seasons and then they quit doing it, but they were capturing all the stuff kind of behind the scenes, right? The guys staying together at a, at an Airbnb, rigging their stuff out on the boats, the, uh, heartache of having a bad tournament day, definitely standing there at weigh in, you know, getting ready for the next day, right? It's a grind a lot. And all everybody really sees is the success and the person standing up on a stage on the bass boat world, holding big fish up. Definitely. And, and there's a whole nother piece to it. And, and part of this, I, I've said too, right? I mean, and part of the goal for for a, a successful YouTube channel, right, is being different than everybody else is. And so uh, there's a lot, like you said, there's a lot of people out there capturing the fishing. And uh, and it's easy to, to go out and capture the fishing, but I really want to capture all the rest of the stuff and, and have an appeal to those that really aren't in the core fishing market and, and let them see this because one of the things that's happened with me traveling around and, you know, say just stopping off in a, in a park to reorganize stuff. You know, I ran into a, a guy and his family and, um, you know, he, he said, man, what, what, what do you do? Like, what's all, what's all this stuff you got? And I said, well, I, I travel around and I do tournaments. And he says, man, I, I knew you were somebody when I saw that great big hummingbird up on the back of the truck. And, <laughs> but, uh, but there's that personal connection that happens. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, he gave me his number and said, Hey, if you need anything at all while you're here, let me know. Wow. And so, wow. uh, we've stayed in contact and you know, all he was struggling on the lake. The next day I went out pre-fishing, got on some fish. I texted him said, Hey, here's the fish I caught. Here's how I caught them. So you can do it now too. And, you know, okay. that's the connection that I want to have with people Definitely. And, and kind of bring them in and show them, not just the fishing side, but Hey, we're people. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of great personalities. There's a lot of people that are really helpful out there. And, and we just happen to fish. Now uh, we forget about the community side of things for sure. And it, that's, I think probably more so than any other outdoors group, I'd say is the fishing community it is very tight knit. It can kind of be a little clicky sometimes, but it is very tight knit. And I think we forget that. And that's, it's easily overlooked. It can be. I said another part on that too, that, uh, that somebody told me, um, as we were talking through, you know, sponsorships and, and things like that, they said, you know what, that some of the most successful people in fishing aren't the best anglers. 
Sure. And this isn't this isn't going to be a knock on them at all, right? But you look at Mike Iaconelli and Gerald Swindle, right? They've had success, but year after year, are they the best? Probably not. But they have the best personalities, and they bring people in. They do, right? Yeah. And and so they're very marketable in that aspect, and and so uh, you know, I, I don't think I have the humor of a Gerald Swindle. Um, I don't have the, I mean, except when I caught that great big 25 and a half inch, I was screaming like I, <laughs> but, uh, that's abnormal for me, but, uh, you know, but I, I think that's part of it too, right. Is finding your way to connect to people and, and build your Definitely. following like that. Definitely. Agreed. No, for sure. You know, I, I, I think that's a, that gives us a good transition point. I mean, obviously the other half of the show and what people come to, come to actually look and learn the learning side is actually talking about the tackle. And I know we talked and you have something we haven't covered on the show yet. So I'd love to dive into that a little bit. Uh, so sure. if you would, uh, I'd love to know what you have brought with us or brought to us tonight. And let's talk about it. All right. So some of the people that I fish with know this is one of my favorite lures, the fluke. It's such a simple thing, but there's a lot that you can do with it. Okay. And, uh, you know, you don't have to get all crazy with it either. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways. If you go out there and start searching, you know, Google and how to rig a, a fluke or a, a soft jerk bait, I mean, you'll come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but you know what? The, the most simple way to do it is just Texas rig. Huh. Right? Okay. So, um, so I just use a, uh, a Trocar TK100 4 aught. So it's an offset round bin hook. And, uh, you know, you'll just nose hook it or not nose hook, but, you know, just put it through the nose and push it up, you know, through that, through there yeah. like that, just a standard, like you do a worm. Yep. Yep. Right. And then just expose the, the uh, point in there. And then you have a weedless bait. So you can fish this th right across the top of weeds. You can let it kind of sink down into those weeds and pop it out. And, um, I don't throw any weight on it. So that's okay. another thing that I get a lot of people ask me too. Um, so in general, I think this is kind of, you know, it's not really top water. You could swim. That's another way that I'll talk about here in a minute, but you can just kind of take this across the top and kind of do that little scatter thing or cause that wake like a wake bait. And mm -hmm. uh, you can catch them like that as that too. But I'll throw this on a, uh, a medium heavy, uh, seven two uh fast rod medium right. fast gotcha. or medium heavy either either one of those would work and um just 12 pound test is what i typically do because i think for me it's kind of that balance of this this hook here and it's you know this isn't a, a light wire hook i mean it's mm -hmm. got a little bit of weight to it but, but not a lot and i find that with that 12 uh weight line and then the uh, the flukes weight, it's the way that, that works for me. Um, gotcha. I can cast it out there, kind of let it sink down a little bit. And I kind of know how fast it's going to sink. And then, um, you know, get it down there a little bit, right? And I'm, I'm not talking five, six foot or anything like that, right? It's, it's two foot, mm -hmm. maybe three at the most, all the way up to the, the top of the water column. And... I typically start fishing this the same way that you'd fish a jerk bait. A couple pops and stop. A couple pops, let it stop. Gotcha. Now the way that you rig the hook into the the nose of the bait. So if I kind of put this up here, right? You can kind of vary whether it's down yeah. or whether yep. it's going up. That will adjust how the bait is reacting as you're putting it through the water. Gotcha. Right, gotcha. As you're giving that jerk on it. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of play around with that kind of based on how you bring the, the rod back or you're pulling up or you pulling uh, directly parallel with the water or you stand it up and, and bringing it kind of a lower sweeping motion or something like that. And, and play around with that and kind of figure out what, what works for you as well, because you can get the, the bait to then climb up or you can get it to go, you know, start climbing down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing, maybe I should have mentioned this. So this is a, a pretty good one. Um, but sometimes you'll pull these out of the package and you'll get 
you know, you've probably seen them, right? The tail's kind of curled up and mm. it's doing one of these things right here, right? So that's not going to go through the water real well. You know so what? If you, if you have a, just a little bit, we can't see it on camera. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. So, so if it's right, if you, so if you're pulling it out and it's, it's up here like this, right? Yeah. Where it's yeah. kind of wadded up and it, they'll kind of stay like that. Well, if you get some hot water and, and dip that tail in there for a mm -hmm. few seconds, it'll soften that up and then you'll get that tail back in that, that nice sleek position there. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to get some, some funny things or inconsistent things going to happen Definitely. with this as you're trying to pull it through there. Um, and this is a, I typically use the super fluke. Okay. So I, I normally go with zoom. I'm not, I'm not, no connection to them or anything like gotcha. that, but gotcha. I, I like the size of the super fluke. I like the weight of it. Um, and, and fish hit it. I mean, it's not, it's not super big. Um, it's not real small either. So it kind of works well with kind mm -hmm. of the weight setup that I use. Then, uh, some other things that I'll do sometimes. So if we talk about colors, so I just brought a couple of the colors I have in here. So one is the albino. So when I had up on the screen there, yeah, so yeah. Um, you can use this or a white or the pearl. Um, you know, it's a pretty good shad imitator. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you can also go with the water's a, not as clear, but it's starting to darken out a little bit or get a little bit stained. Then I'll go to the smoke shad, which is okay. a gray with a light gray bottom on it. And then if I'm in an area that has like bluegill that they're chasing with that, then I'll go with a watermelon seed, gotcha. the watermelon red, a little bit of red flake in there. Mm -hmm. um, kind of be able to hit both sides of, you know, shad lake and then a bluegill type lake with that. Then we always look for ways to try to uh, make our bait look a little bit different than everybody else's. So one of the things that I'll do, especially on this watermelon seed with the, the red in there, is I'll dip it in some red dye. So I'll put a little bit of red dye on the tail or I'll come up here on, and I'll do this on the smoke shad as well. I'll use a Q-tip and I'll put a little bit of dye up here where the uh, gill would be. Sure. So kind of that yeah. little bit of a, a bleeding gill kind of effect. And uh, I don't know. It works for me. Uh, it gives me more confidence. So it's, it's what I do. Um, That's half the battle. We were down at, uh, we were down at Cotto and uh, Red River area last year for the KBF national championship and you know i was dying half of this thing red like all the way up here huh. and uh and you know catching good fish doing that so um i don't know it just it worked for me and uh but I, i'd say play around with that too you know uh, not everybody believes in the whole dying or or sense or all that kind of stuff but it doesn't hurt and, and uh you know, sometimes i think it makes it makes a little bit of a difference no, that's awesome. You know, it's it's interesting you, you bring this up because for all the time, not that it's been a long time that I've been in the fishing world, it doesn't seem like this is a a, a bait that uh, that people are always talking about. You know, it's it's always a Senko worm or it's always, you know, it doesn't seem to be a fluke, which is interesting that, you know, I, I'd never try one just, just cause, you know, I, I really never thought anything different of it than anything else. So this is definitely going to change my opinion. I got to get out there and fish it now. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's simple, right? I mean, yeah. I think that's, it, it doesn't have that sexy new p appeal that, you know, people are coming out with new stuff. And sometimes we forget about some of these old things like this that have been around a long time, mm -hmm. but, but they still work. So, um, I encourage people to go out, give it a try. And, uh, you know, we're, if you're in a situation that you're like, man, I'd really love to be able to throw a jerk bait right? But you have treble hooks and you're around a lot of weedy cover and stuff like that. A lot of fluke and, and give that a try. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of that, that same thing, right? Where you can fish it real slow. If it's that colder time or you can take it real fast. Like I was talking about right across the top of the water and kind of cause that wake. And, uh, it's, it's fun to get a top water strike on one of these. Oh, I bet. <laughs> A lot of people don't realize that that's a, you know, really a, a good way to fish this. Um, if you kind of, I mean, that's how I fish it, you know, 99% of the time, right? It's just Texas rigged. 
Gotcha. Um, one of the other things that you can do, and this is a, a tip that I learned not too long ago. So if you look at this and you kind of the way it's laid out, you think that's kind of the, the way it should go through the water, right? Like that looks fishy. Yeah, well, yeah. You can you can flip it upside down, hmm. and and upside down being right, you have the split in the bottom here. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the downfalls of any soft plastic is if you're text posing it and when that hook pops through, right, it, it rips and it'll start tearing up this upper section of the, mm -hmm. of the plastic. Well, if you're not in a, a weedy area, you can flip this over and then your hook is going to kind of reside down in, right, down inside mm -hmm. that split. And when it pops out for you catching a fish, it's not tearing anything. So there's another little tip on how to make, you know, a fluke and a soft plastic like this last longer. Huh. Is just flip it, not text pose it through that plastic. Only text pose it through the plastic when you're in that weedy area and you really need that, that weedless um, bit there. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. So do you like to, so if I'm understanding you like to fish it, you'll cast right on through the weeds and you'll bring it right back and retrieve it either as it swims through the weeds or right on the top as we kind of almost skim the surface. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great great way to do it. Um, you can fish it right along the, the weed line too. Um, you know, if you're kind of afraid of getting a jerk bait in there and afraid you're going to you know snag it up on the yeah. weeds, that's yeah. Um, I mean, this that's what this is, right? This is a a soft plastic jerk bait. Um, a fluke right. is just the the name that Zoom gave to it, and that's what most people just refer to these as. Gotcha. So there's other ways to fish them. Um, and if you go out and you do a lot of searches on it, you can find some different things. One of the ways that's kind of popular and gets talked about is to use a rivet and go in through the nose of the bait and run it all the way down through. And you kind of end up with that hollow uh, passage going through here. Then you can run your fishing line down through the bait, then put a, a swivel or, or something like that down here and then put a treble hook in the, in the bottom Huh. Then you can take that treble, stick the one up in the, you know, the split here mm -hmm. and then take the other two and then they're hanging back. And so it's not weedless, yeah. but yeah. you've got an extra hook on there that if something comes up there, right, you can, you can get it snagged on that, that treble hook. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that, it's another weedless way or a weightless way to fish a fleet. No, there's tons of options. I mean, with with the folds, it definitely gives you a lot of options as far as presentation and and rigging and all that. No, that that makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm surprised. It's it's something I'm gonna definitely have to put it into the arsenal and see if I can uh, if I can have any luck with. So it's it's something I'm gonna go pick up. Oh, this is a great time of year to be fishing it, right? Because we're we're where all the the shad are starting to school up, mm -hmm. and you know you start seeing those bigger bass coming up there hitting on them. Toss a fluke out in there, um, you know, do something that's make it stand out a little bit from, from all the other shad that are there. But this is a great thing to throw as those uh, shad are schooling up in the fall. Nice. Okay. And then, like I said, early spring is a great time to fish it. Um, Cause that's a lot of times when people would want to throw a, a jerk bait, mm -hmm. kind of fish it a little bit slower, but Honestly, you can fish this any time of year. I, mean, no, I do. That's awesome. That's um, awesome. It's not, not, not very often you don't see me have one of these tied on. Dang. Okay, I'm excited. I gotta get me some of those. I'm. An, I, I think I'm. I think I'm headed out to the lake on Sunday. I'm gonna have to stop at uh, the local bait shop and grab some. So I, uh, I gotta try them out for sure. Yeah. No, that's yeah, awesome. They're, they're, they're great. Um, you can do some other things with these, right? You can. If you wanted to get down a little bit lower, right, you could put like a little ball head, mm -hmm. uh, little ball head jig on here and, and go with a hook out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could, you know, you could go with I mean, any kind of weight that you can put up on the, on the front here. Um, personally, I don't do that with a fluke. Um, for me, if I'm, if I'm going to go something like that, I, I typically want something that's going to have a little more action on the tail. So I'll go with something that's got a little bit of a paddle tail on the back mm -hmm. versus just this, the split fork here. 
Gotcha. But uh, but there's people that do it. I mean, I guess if they're they're really not chasing something that's got a lot of activity or a lot of action in the tail, you could do that. This is going to be pretty dead like that. You know, going through the water, right? I mean, this is kind of that darting, like you mm -hmm. see with the jerk bait. It's kind of that same thing. Um, you're not really getting a lot out of this tail, so for me, I don't do it. Now they do offer a uh, a paddle tail version of a fluke. Um, I have a friend that I think typically goes with that version of it. Um, I don't. I just don't use that one very often. I'll go to something else if I'm going to throw something with a paddle tail. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. No. Okay. So you like to split tail then? Okay. That's awesome. Dang, man, this is this has been great. I uh, I know I got to get out there. Do you have any other? I know you've you've given a lot of recommendations as far as application using it, all that. I mean, any other any other uh, recommendations on on using a fluke or or how and best practices? Anything to to hit us with? Yeah, so I think too, right? I mean, a lot of these old baits that have been around for a long time is there's a lot of different ways to do them, right? And and you got to figure out how to make it your own. Um, so I remember one time we were we were out fishing and there was a, a little hole in some grass and I tossed in there I was fishing a fluke and I was just doing my little two, two pop, uh, action, catch a fish, hmm. cast back in there, pop, pop, catch a fish. Huh? But there was a guy we were out there with and he was struggling a little bit. And I said, Hey, come over here, you know, set him all up with everything. And, uh, he goes, I said, cast right in there. He cast right in there. And he's, you know, he's doing his, his pop pop, but I guess it was different than my pop pop and he wouldn't catch any fish. I was like, well, let me see if there's any fish still in there. So I cast back in there, pop, pop, caught a fish. Oh man. So, so I, it's one of those, like you have to figure out how to make any lure your own, right? What works for you? Um, you know, you hear about people doing say a chatter bait, right? I mean, you could look at that and say, oh, that's such a simple thing to fish right? You just cast it out there and you just reel it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the guys that are probably the best with a chatterbait aren't just reeling it, right? They've got some little, some little hitch in there, the way that they reel or they, you know, a little hiccup or something like that, or they put a little pause in it or they're doing something Definitely. with the rod. Yeah. So it's, there's always something that somebody does that's successful with a lure. And that's what I would say with this is the same thing, right? Figure out how to make it yours and and then stick with that. And then it becomes kind of natural. Um, right. I don't think about it too much when I'm, I'm fishing one of these, the, I just do what I do and it, and it works. So that's what, that's what I would recommend for people is I'm going to go out here and try it, you know, get set up in the front of the nose, you know, to get it to, to go up or down, uh, give it the, you know, whatever the right pop is for you. Right? Cause it, I mean, I, you can give it like sh a lot of times I'm just doing like short little uh, jerks. I'm not doing these right. Like with a, 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 a hard jerk bait, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of times I'm ripping it, you know, a lot, a lot more. Like if you start trying to rip this, it's, it's going to be up on the top of the water. Sure. Yeah. Right. Or you're ripping it out of the top. So <laughs> it comes flying at you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's part of it too. Right. You got to, got to figure out how, how to keep it below the, the top of the water, where you want it to be in there and, and then kind of how you need to work it to make it work for you. And I'm not trying to overcomplicate it, but you know, if somebody goes out there and says, Oh, well, Alan said that this is just like fishing a jerk bait and they're out there watching KVD ripping a, a jerk bait, you know, like he's like, he's <laughs> never going to get it back. <laughs> and they go out there and try to do this thing then then it's not going to work like that. they're going to be right? disappointed so, for sure i i call this the, the way that i fish it kind of a, a power finesse hmm. okay that makes i could see that right because it's it it is a finesse bait but it's not like a drop shot where it's just sitting there mm -hmm. it's moving and so i'm kind of powering it through so i call it power finesse and uh, maybe that's just some made up thing that I did, but a lot of people can relate to it. And you can do these too, right? You, a lot of people put these right on a drop shot, right? You can nose hook it. Um, and just let it sit there. Um, but I don't know. I have other things I'd rather do with it. Yeah. 
make it make it work. No, you have other you have other ways you rather fish. I, no, I, I I'm glad you brought that up because I think everyone gets so stuck in, in well, he said to do exactly this, and it's you know every every pond, every river, every every lake is different. You know the the way you do it is slightly different than the way you know that they are going to do it, and it's just like you said, you kind of have to find your own groove, get into a rhythm, and and try. You know, and it's all about getting out there and doing it for sure. Yeah, it is. Um, and I think I think a lot of people fall into like you said. You know, somebody said, "We'll do it this way." Mm -hmm. And and you said like different rakes, rivers. That right? It might even be that way in an hour. Yeah. From right now, and so it, I think that's another a big lesson that that a lot of people need to take away is is we need to adjust. Um, I just give an example here, and I won't say who it was, but uh, I was fishing out on the lake, and um, conditions had totally changed from what it was when we were pre-fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, weather was warm, pre-fishing. We had cold fronts come through. I mean, I'm talking like low 40 degrees when we're starting the day, and we had yeah. been yeah. Uh, upper 70s. Wow. Before. Okay. All right. So free fishing, they were out uh, throwing a buzz bait, and they caught like midday, like three o'clock in the afternoon. They'd caught some good fish on a buzz bait, 70 degree, some degree weather. Well, conditions completely changed. They were on a total finesse bite. They weren't chasing anything. And, um, but that person was still out there throwing that buzz bait because in pre fishing, that's how they caught them. That's work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, well, hey, you know, that's not how they're biting. And, you know, I even said that. It's like, well, that's not what they're biting on. Like, you should switch. Like, I'm, if you don't want to catch fish, don't change. But, but just because something worked three days ago, and I see this so much, right? Just because something worked three days ago doesn't mean that's how the fish are going to bite today. Agreed. So being Agreed. willing to adapt. No, you got to try new things, try a different retrieve, try a different bait, try a different color. I mean, it could be any number of things. And yet again, that's what it is to, that, that's the exact sport of fishing. That's why we call it fishing. You know, it's, it, it can be such a crap shoot sometimes, but eventually you, you hit the winning combination and you figure it out. Yeah. I guess I'll say that too. Cause you brought up color, right? So I listed off what three or four different colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't I don't get real caught up in color. Uh, if you go talk to, you know, these guys that are the best pros in the world, they don't get real caught up in color, right? They don't they don't have twenty different colors of mm -hmm. fish. Sure. Right. I mean, it's for me, it's it's one that looks like a shad color, one that maybe that darker shad color, mm -hmm. and then something that looks like this bluegill type color. Yeah, right? exactly. so Maybe it's three. That's it. I'm not going going and saying, well, I need white and uh, uh, albino and the smoke shad, right? And, and this, and this, and this, like, keep this simple, right? This is a, I agree. <laughs> we don't, uh, I see so many people that do that and they're just so caught up. Now, maybe, right, if you have your home lake that you spend hours and hours and hours on and, and you have it so tuned in, Right, that really they bite so much better if you throw something that's got purple and pink flake in it versus something that's just a standard color. Maybe that's it. But um, you know, you think about tournament anglers, and I try to look at this from a tournament tournament anglers aspect because mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing. We don't have time to go through and figure out which one of the twenty colors of the rainbow yeah. it might be. Agreed. So. Agreed. Get it as close as we can, and and you know they'll bite. I don't, I don't think, especially on a moving bait like this, right? I don't think they're so caught up and looking at it and saying, "Oh, you know what? That's watermelon red flake. It's not green pumpkin. That's not the color I want today." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not to that level of detail. I agree. No, I think we're I think we're more concerned in generalities. It it kind of looks like this, or it kind of looks like that, and I think that's I, that's the attitude I typically take, and I I would I would I would agree with that. Yeah, bait companies probably don't like it because they're kind no, of no, no, hell no. Gear, but you have to have red, you have to have red and blue, you have to have blue, you have to have green, you know, you have to have all the colors, every single one. So, yeah, yeah. Now, you know what? And I tell you what, this has been really great. And I appreciate you coming on with us tonight, Alan. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this up, but I wanted to, to ask you what has been your favorite purchase this year, fishing related? You know, obviously, it's going to be different for you than, say, 
you know, the guy that goes and fishes on the weekend because you're doing something entirely different. But I'm just curious, you know, what, what's what been your favorite purchase you made this year to help in your fishing? Mm. So I would have to say it was the, oh man, I, I, I made a totally big change. We kind of touched on it before, right? So um, I moved on to the Bonafide team so that, <laughs> So the, the bonafide kayak was new to me, but the, uh, the addition of the motor guide, with oh, the spot okay. walk pinpoint yeah. yep. functionality, um, has definitely been a changer for me. Gotcha. Um, you know, I pedaled before and, and that was good and you know, got me around and that kind of stuff. But you know, the, the video I was working on editing here today. Um, I'm on a river, smallmouth fishing, and I could just hit that lock button and just sit there in the current. And uh, if you guys go watch that video when I release it here in the next couple of days, you'll, there's another angler that was out there, and uh, he was in a pedal drive kayak. And I'm not I'm not bashing any any company at all, but mid morning, he actually came by, and I have it on video. Where he's like, man, I just can't do this. Right. It's like that trolling motor makes all the difference because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to hold in this current. Every time I get into position, I can make two casts and then I'm out of position again. Exactly. So, yeah. um, that's been a big, big change for me. The other thing that's allowed me to do is to stand up and fish. Agreed. So that, that may not sound like a big deal, but, uh, the, the, from a visibility aspect, mm -hmm. you know, being able to see where that weed line is and where to cast to, um, it's, gosh, it's changed so much, so much about the way that I fish. So that's one, I, I know a lot of people are going to start putting motors on kayaks. Yeah. Um, uh, I would definitely look at, at going with a bow mount. Um, again, it's nothing against the, you know, those that are going on the back, but, uh, that, that locking, changes things so much well and that's what you know and you have probably looked at them before you you made the investment but you know something like the old town where they have the uh uh the mincota upgrade where you know same thing with the spot lock and you know their their version of it and all that but it's uh, uh -huh. no it's it's incredible i mean the the versatility and, and the tool that that provides is, is insane you don't find that anywhere else i mean it's just it's just wild for sure so it is it is it's, it's probably the biggest, been the biggest changer for my fishing this year, for sure. Huh. No, that's awesome. Well, I, with that, man, I know, uh, I know you want to get back to editing some video, which is I'm sure what you were doing before you uh, joined us tonight, <laughs> you can get your YouTube back up and running. And uh, I just want to say thank you very much for coming on with us tonight. I definitely appreciate it. Uh, tell everybody where they can find you. Yeah. Well, first appreciate you having me on here to talk about this share a little bit about myself yeah yeah um so i'm on uh, facebook under alan reed uh instagram under under the radar fishing uh youtube under under the radar fishing um so yeah uh under the radar fishing that's that's me that's my brand uh we're working on a new logo for that right now so um you know that's I'll just share this one real quick. So a lot of people uh, thought that thought before that my under the radar was all about the fact that I, I fished out of a radar kayak uh -huh. and, and it really, was it really wasn't. Uh, I mean, it was kind of a punny thing, right? Yeah, but, uh, yeah. but it's, it's really, I feel like a lot of times I just kind of float under the radar and, and uh, you know, there's a, those top guys that are really up there getting all the attention and that kind of stuff. And I'm just down here doing my thing. So. Uh, well, no, you keep, you keep doing it, man. You're, you're giving all kinds of good info, especially like tonight. I know you're, you're doing, you're doing the good work, especially the admin stuff, like you said, and, and that working with uh, uh, in the tournaments that you are and, and helping to kind of put together. So that's, that's important stuff for sure. So keep flying under the radar, man. You're doing a fantastic job. I appreciate it. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, thank you again for coming on with us tonight. We're going to go ahead and, and cut this one off here. I'll leave links for all your social and all that stuff where everyone can find you so they can go and follow you. So everybody go and follow Alan. You know, obviously he, he spent some time here with us tonight, teaching us how to fish the flukes. So 
give him a like, give him a follow, go watch some of his videos and connect with him. It's definitely, definitely be worth it. So Appreciate it, man. yeah, absolutely. We're going to go ahead and, uh, and make this the end, man. Thanks. Thanks for coming on.